So from previous episodes, we know that prehistoric China went through a period of rule under an iron-fisted uh, ruler. So will this trend of uh, rule by iron-fisted rulers uh, continue with the remaining three um, sage kings depicted in ancient China? Well, we'll find out more in today's episode of Myths of China. Hello and welcome to the Chain Smoking Writers channel, where we share the myths, legends and histories of the Chinese people from the first creator to the last imperial dynasty. More than 6,000 years of stories, one video at a time. Now if you'd like to join us on this travel and journey through time, remember, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so you'll be updated whenever a new video drops. In today's episode, we'll continue our journey through time and talk about the third of the five sage kings of ancient China. His name was Di Ku. Now, Di Ku was a great grandson of Huang Di, the grandson of Shao Hao, and his father was Jiao Ji. Now, par for cause, as with most mythology, Di Ku was said to have been born with an extremely unusual look. Well, it was said that he had a bird-like face with uh, goat horns growing out of his head and a skinny body that looked like a newborn monkey with uh, thick hair covering every inch of his skin. Of course, it would come with a prerequisite show of superior intellect and virtue as in most myths. Uh, so Ku was uh, described to be able to speak and write his own name from birth and had a natural compassion for people. And by the time Ku was in his early teens, his reputation of intelligence had already spread far and wide throughout the land. And it was during this time that nine fringe kingdoms formed an alliance to attack the lands of his uncle, Zhuan Xi, the Black Emperor. Now, Zhuan Xi, uh, having heard of Ku's uh, intelligence invited him to court and asked him for a way to repel the enemies. And during his audience, Ku told his uncle that it would be foolish to take on the armies of all nine fringe kingdoms at once, you know, head on. Uh, instead, it would be a wiser move to uh, sow discord within the enemy alliance and wait for the infighting to start before, you know, picking up the pieces after. Now, Zhuang Xi was extremely pleased with this suggestion and immediately sent out uh, agents to spread rumors and misinformation among his enemies. And it wasn't long before the idea actually worked. The leaders of the nine fringe kingdoms let their mistrust and suspicions of each other get the better of them. And a fight broke out uh, between them, just as Ku had predicted. Zhuang Xi then led his own troops uh, to sweep up the remnants of his broken enemies and the war just ended uh, before it barely even started. So in recognition of the contributions that uh, Ku made to this uh, effort, uh, Zhuang Xi, the Black Emperor, granted Ku the land of Xin to rule over as his own. Now Xin was a low, low-lying area that was pretty much prone to floods and because of that, the people had to lead a semi-nomadic lifestyle to um, migrate you know, around the flood seasons to find you know, higher ground and, and drier ground. It was a greatly unstable life for the people and they suffered greatly because uh, they almost could not farm properly due to the floods and the droughts that come in bouts, you see. Seeing the problem, Ku tried to um, solve it by raising the ground level. But the floods will always come and wash away the progress they had made uh, before they could stabilize the ground. And in a fit of anger, Ku went up to the heavenly realms to lodge a complaint to the, to the deities and the gods. Uh, he basically went up there and caused a great ruckus before the Jade Emperor. His argument was that um, since the gods and deities claim to watch over humanity, claim to watch over the realm of man, they had the responsibility to make sure that such sufferings should not be happening to the innocent people who were just trying to lead a proper life. Now, Ku actually raised such a huge stink in the heavenly realms that um, 
you know, the Jade Emperor was kind of embarrassed about the whole situation. And in a bid to kind of preserve the peace in the heavenly courts and basically just to get rid of this rebel rouser, um, the Jade Emperor sent deities to the land of sin and raised the ground considerably, ensuring that flood waters would never wash over the, land, uh, the region again. So now rid of the floods, the people could now rebuild their homes and uh, lead a more stable life of uh, productivity. They could farm the land and they could you know, build more permanent settlements. And um, they renamed the place Kao Sin, uh, which literally translates to High Sin or Highland Sin. And Ku was in a way uh, known. He was also known and recognized in some um, quarters by the land that he saved. In Fan Shi's later years, he saw that Ku was uh, highly intelligent, uh, very virtuous, and he commanded the respect and the love of the people. So he decided that Ku would be his successor to, to be the next sovereign of men. And thus, when uh, Zhuan Shi passed away, Ku ascended to the throne as the next sovereign, the next ruler of the realm. And um, he added the title T as a prefix to his name and was there henceforth known as uh, Ti Ku, the White Emperor or the White Sage King. Now, Ti Ku was a wise and benevolent ruler, you know, almost in direct contrast to his predecessor who was a uh, heavy-handed and, you know, uh, tough and harsh. Ti Ku would always put the needs of his people above all other priorities and he was far-sighted enough to prepare for unforeseen circumstances and meticulous enough to ensure that the details of his policies uh, would not have adverse effects on the people that he was ruling. He was empathetic to the sufferings of the people but he was also strict in the enforcement of rules and laws uh, his reign was actually marked by a golden age of peace, prosperity, and a gentle rule. Uh, and as I mentioned before, this was as opposed to his uncle's reign of harsh laws and uh, conflicts and wars. Throughout Ti Ku's reign, the peace was only ever tainted by a small skirmish that was stopped before it even really got started. Now, Tiku would uh, travel seasonally throughout his land on inspection trips and to get to know the realm and to get to know the people. And in the spring and summer, he would travel by riding a dragon. And uh, in autumn and winter, he would uh, move around by riding on a horse. Now, on one of these trips to the south with his consort, uh, there was a rebellion that was being fomented by a general Wu. Uh, which broke out around the Yumong Lakes area. But before any major harm could have been done, um, Ti Ku's magical hound, uh, Pan Hu, snuck into the enemy camp and um, basically killed General Wu with a bite. You know, literally chilled him to pieces and thus ending the rebellion before it actually even started. Now, possibly due to the influence of his uh, grandfather, Shao Hao, who, as you know, was the ruler of the kingdom of birds, Ti Ku also had an unusual affinity to birds and music. Now, birds all over the land were friendly to him and uh, they would break into song in his presence. And phoenixes were also extremely close to him. And one could almost always see phoenixes dancing around him, you know, in his presence. Now, being the avid uh, music lover, just like his grandfather Shao Hao, uh, Ti Ku actually ordered the craftsman um, Yue Chui to make drums, bells, pipes, chimes, uh, ocarinas and flutes. And he then also ordered the musician Xian Hei to compose the pieces uh, Jiu Zhao, Liu Lie and Liu Ying uh, among many other compositions. Uh, he would then choreograph uh, dances, you know, he got together a troupe of 64 beautiful dancers and he choreographed dances to accompany these uh, music and compositions. Now, when all was ready and the formal performance was put on in the court, 
uh, phoenixes and long-tailed golden pheasants and uh, other magical and mythical birds of the realm uh, joined in for the performance and sang and danced uh, along to the music. Now, the people commented that uh, phoenixes will only appear in times of great peace and prosperity. And therefore, the, the sightings of these phoenixes always around Tiku was an endorsement of uh, his rule, was an endorsement of the, the, the good job that Tiku was doing in you know, looking after the realm. And that's why Tiku is always remembered as a benevolent ruler, a kind man and a good lord who oversaw an unprecedented period of peace and prosperity for his people. You could call it the first um, golden age of prehistoric China. He lived with no suffering and no illness and no sickness to the ripe old age of 105 before he passed away. Now I hope you enjoyed learning more about the White Emperor or the White Sage King, Ti Ku. Uh, well, I certainly did enjoy sharing this story with you. And if you like the story, uh, please remember to smash the like button. It will really help the channel out. And now, let's move on to bonus facts. Now, apart from being remembered as a benevolent ruler, the White King or the White Emperor, Ti Ku, was also known as the father of dynasties because uh, apart from, from being the ruler of the land, his uh, descendants went on to found uh, various important dynasties in uh, Chinese history or at least the founders of those dynasties uh, claim descendants from him. It was said that Ti Ku had four consorts and all four of them gave birth to pretty important people in Chinese history. His first consort was uh, Princess Jiang Yuan, a princess of the kingdom of uh, Youtai, which is in today's uh, Shanxi province. It was said that uh, she got pregnant after stepping in the footsteps of a giant and gave birth to Qi. Uh, basically, literally translated, it meant the abandoned. Now, Qi was uh, variously abandoned in alleys, in the deep woods and finally even in icy wastelands. Uh, however, wherever he was abandoned, all manners of birds and bees protected him and nurtured him. And when Qi grew up, he had a deep passion for agriculture and led the people in advancing uh, farming techniques and irrigation techniques. And the people named him Hou Ji, and he was uh, supposedly the ancestor of the later Zhou Dynasty. Now, Ti Ku's second consort was the Princess Jian Di, a princess of the kingdom of You Song, which would be in today's uh, Gansu province. Now, it was said that when uh, Jian Di was taking a bath in the hot springs of the Black Pool with her sister Jian Zi, a black swallow flew overhead and dropped an egg. Now, uh, Jian Di picked up the egg and ate it and got pregnant. So, uh, after a while, she gave birth to another Qi, who was later recognized as the ancestor of the Shang dynasty. Ti Ku's third consort was uh, Qing Tu, who was supposedly a daughter of the Jade Emperor, uh, born in the wastelands of uh, Dou Wei, uh, which is somewhere around today's Hebei. She was first adopted by the Chenfeng tribe and later adopted by this person named Yin Changru. Now, Qing Tu always had a golden cloud floating above her head and was considered to be a sign that uh, she was uh, blessed. When Ti Ku's mother heard about her and her blessings, uh, she encouraged Ti Ku to marry her. And Qing Tu would later give birth to the next sage king, uh, Yao the Great. The fourth consort of Ti Ku was a lady named uh, Chang Yi. Uh, she was a lady of exceptional beauty and with silky black hair that cascaded like a waterfall down to her heels. Uh, she would give birth to a daughter and later a son named Zhi. Zhi would actually ascend to the throne as um, Ku's uh, successor, but uh, he would abdicate after nine years of rule in favor of his brother Yao, who later became known as Yao the Great. Now, apart from the aforementioned offsprings, uh, Ti Ku also had two other sons named uh, Yu Bo and Shi Chen. Now, these two brothers never saw eye to eye on anything 
it was as if they were born to be at each other's throats, you know, and they were like the arch nemesis of each other. No matter how hard Ti Ku tried to mediate between them and soothe things over, you know, between them, they would back at they would be back at each other's throats uh, once their father was out of sight. And after trying for years and years, uh, Ti Ku was finally at his wit's ends and. Um, the only thing he could do was send these two sons away to opposite ends of the realm. Uh, so Yu Po was to serve and take care of the star Antares, and um, Shi Chen was to uh, take care of the star Betelgeuse. So when one star rose in the sky, the other would be setting, and thus the brothers never saw each other ever again. So as we mentioned, Tiku lived to a ripe old age of 105, a peaceful life, you know, until 105. And his reign of peace actually lasted about 70 years. Now he left behind a legacy that uh, few uh, would ever surpass and, well, if uh, stories were to believe, planted the seeds of future great dynasties in uh, Chinese history and Chinese civilization. Now I hope you enjoyed this uh, video as much as I enjoyed making it and if you did, please remember to um, like and subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the bell icon so be uh, updated whenever a new video drops. Now this uh, channel would not be possible without the generous support of uh, Patreon supporters. So if you would like to become a Patreon supporter and you know help the channel out, the links are available in the description box. And if you would just like to connect with me, you know, on other social media platforms or check out our website, um, all the links are also available in the description box. And if you have anything to say to me and you have any suggestions or feedbacks regarding the channel, the story, the production, you know, feel free to leave a comment. Um, we sometimes have pretty interesting banter going on in the comment section, so don't be shy, you know, leave a comment down below. Uh, and I usually will personally look through the comments and respond to all of them if possible. And I guess that's it for today and I'll see you soon in the next episode.